This video is sponsored by Squarespace, more on them later in this video. Now I've done my best to get my hands on the most popular 65% form factor keyboards. And well, this massive pile of keyboards is the result of that. So which one of these keyboards is actually worth buying? Let's start things off with the Fnatic Streak 65 LP, which probably is the most mainstream keyboard in this video. This is a low profile keyboard and as we would expect from Fnatic, it's geared towards gaming. And the Streak 65 is a pretty popular keyboard for gaming. It's compact and lightweight, which is nice if you have a more portable setup or even want to bring it to LAN events. I'm personally not a big fan of lightweight keyboards, but I can see the appeal of having something lightweight like this that's just a bit over 400 grams and easily packs in your backpack. And as this is a low profile keyboard, you don't even need to bring a wrist rest. So I can see why some people really like the Streak 65. The one that I have here is the LP version, by the way, which already is the second iteration of the Streak 65. And it now comes with double shot PVT keycaps, a coiled cable, and Fnatic put a layer of dampening foam inside. I really like the texture and grippiness of the new PVT keycaps, and they feel nice and grippy for gaming. The switches though, I don't like them. They are low profile switches, so naturally I wouldn't expect them to feel as nice and good as full size switches. But that being said, they are very scratchy. And the Streak 65 does not have hot swap sockets, so you're basically stuck with these switches unless you enjoy soldering. At a price of about $120, I really wish this had hot swap sockets, especially as this $110 low profile keyboard does have hot swap sockets. And it comes with much nicer switches to begin with. These are Gateron low profile reds and they're so much smoother than the Kale switches of the Streak 65. This keyboard is the Air 60 by NuFi, which is marketed as a 60% keyboard, but as it does have full arrow keys, this basically makes it a 65% keyboard in my eyes. So in comparison to the Streak 65, you're losing three of the side keys as well as the right control key and the right shift is only one U. But this makes the Air 60 even a bit more compact. And for typing, this really is much nicer than the Streak 65. But the Streak 65 is marketed as a fast keyboard for gaming, whereas Nufi seem to be targeting a pretty different audience that probably doesn't care too much about latency and that kind of stuff. So is the Streak 65 actually faster? To find that out, I've measured the time it takes between pressing a key and the reaction showing up on screen. Or to be a bit more precise, the full end-to-end -end latency between the keyboard switch making a sound and the photons emitted by the monitor being registered by the NVIDIA LDAT sensor. So this technically also contains various delays caused by the PC and monitor, but it gives us a good idea of how these keyboards stack up against each other. And well, there really isn't that much of a difference. In fact, the Air 60 is actually ever so slightly faster than the Streak 65. Let's throw in some more results for some context. But please remember that this is far from a perfect testing methodology, so you really shouldn't overestimate small differences. When using these keyboards and all the other keyboards back to back, they all feel equally responsive to me and I don't feel that any of those keyboards has a perceivable delay. But let me know if you want to see more in-depth latency testing on keyboards in the future, perhaps with a more refined testing methodology. Anyways, the Air 60 is a great alternative to the Streak 65 LP if you're looking for a highly portable, low profile keyboard. And I'd actually even choose this over the Streak 65 as a low profile gaming keyboard specifically, even if it's not marketed as a gaming keyboard. Now for the same money as these low profile keyboards, you could actually get both of these keyboards. These are the two cheapest keyboards we're gonna be looking at in this video. It's the Royal Clutch RK68 and the NB6081 Nimbleback by LTC. Both of them go for about $55 each, which is pretty affordable for a hot swap compatible mechanical keyboard. Now, at first glance, both of these look very similar, almost if they were the same keyboard with a slightly different layout. Part of that surely is due to the very similar keycaps. Both of them use a pretty generic double shot ABS keycap set. They're not 100% identical, but that doesn't really matter as they basically look and feel the same. 
The keycaps are just about 1mm thick and really do feel and sound a bit cheap. Which really isn't unexpected as these keyboards are just slightly over 50 bucks each. But with both of these keyboards you probably want to pick up a better set of keycaps down the road. The stock switches are fine though. Both LTC and Royal Clutch offer the choice between the standard red, blue and brown switches. And the samples that I have here are both equipped with their respective linear red switches. LTC sourced their switches from Jersey, while the switches in the RK68 are Royal Clutch branded. But honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if these were coming out of the same factory, as they do feel very similar, just like a typical red switch. Which surely isn't bad for an affordable entry-level keyboard. So much for the similarities between these two, but it's pretty clear that the layout and size are a bit different. The NB681 Nimbleback has the arrow keys and side keys separated, which makes it a wider keyboard. This might already be enough for some people to prefer the RK68 over the Nimbleback because it's about an inch shorter, taking a bit less space on the desk. The larger Nimbleback though has a few features that the RK68 doesn't have. Its top cover is removable, which is nice in case you like the floating keycaps look or want to do a custom paint job. It also comes with an integrated USB hub and fully customizable multicolor RGB. The RK68 on the other hand only has single color LEDs that shine in an Nice blue color. Though the RK68 does come with Bluetooth, whereas the Nimbleback is wired only. When it comes to the typing sound, I prefer the slightly fuller and a bit deeper sound of the Nimbleback. But I have to say that the modifier keys sound a bit better with the RK68. But decide for yourself. Squarespace makes starting your own website a breeze. You get a jump start by choosing a template from their huge library, which contains great looking templates for various types of websites. And then you can play around with hundreds of custom settings in the design panel to give your website your own unique style. And Squarespace automatically optimizes your website for mobile devices, making sure that it also looks good on smaller screens. You can try out the design process for free and when you're ready to launch your own website, use the code TECHLESS to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain. Or just go to squarespace.com slash techless. Back to the video. Now stepping things up a bit, we got 6 keyboards in the $80 to $100 price range. Echo sent over their 3068B in the World Tour Tokyo edition, which might or might not be your style. But at least the other more subtle color variants of the 3068B are very popular in the sub $100 price range. And the Yanzi YZ68 is a very fitting competitor. It also retails for about $95 and overall is pretty comparable in its feature set and overall quality. Both of these keyboards are a noticeable step up from the RK68 and Nimbleback. Part of that surely comes down to the Dysub PBT keycaps that feel much nicer and are a good bit thicker than the cheap ABS keycaps. The keycaps and the fact that both of these keyboards support Bluetooth and 2.4 GHz connectivity kinda already justify the additional cost over the RK68 and NB681. But they also just type and sound way nicer than the entry level boards. And between the 3068B and YZ68, my choice would be the YZ68. It sounds less echoey and hollow, and I personally prefer how the stabilizers are tuned. But honestly, the competition in this segment is extremely tough, so the YZ68 by far isn't the only good option below $100. And even though the YZ68 is a pretty nice keyboard, it's fairly limited in color choices and the mint green keycaps are surely not for everyone. I think the next two keyboards we'll be looking at are a bit more appealing overall. This is the TH68 by Apple Maker, which also comes with some really nice Dysub PBT keycaps and it has a knob. It has a somewhat higher pitched sound signature that also sounds pretty nice. Which sound signature you prefer basically comes down to preference.
What I especially like about the TH68 is that Apple Maker offer this with quite a few interesting switch choices in addition to our typical Gateron switches. These switches that I have here are called Seasort and they kind of remind me of a slightly heavier Gateron Pro Yellow. You definitely notice that these are factory looped as they're pretty smooth out of the box. I also have Apple Maker's Flamingo switches on hand, which also can be configured with the TH68. They're a bit lighter than the Seasort switches and I'd say even a tad bit smoother. Some really nice switch choices, I have to say. Now, some of you might know the TH68 under a different name because this is almost the same keyboard as the Gamma K LK67. I'm saying all almost here, because there seem to be some distinctions that do actually make a difference when it comes to how they sound. Now part of that sound difference can be attributed to different switches and keycaps. But even with the same keycaps and switches, they still produce a different sound. I swapped out the keycaps and switches of the G and H keys, so both keyboards are using the switches and keycaps of the other keyboard on these keys. Neither of these keyboards comes with case foam, so this can't explain the differences. And both have PCB foam pre-installed. The only visual difference, apart from the different color schemes, is that the Apple Maker keyboard comes with a black PCB instead of a white one. Not sure if the PCB is what makes the difference, but personally, I prefer how the TH68 sounds. I also prefer the stabilizers that Apple Maker use. And the TH68 is even slightly cheaper than the LK67 coming in at $99.99. The LK67 as a barebone without switches and keycaps goes for $65.99. So for comparable build, you're looking at about $15 to $20 more than the Apple Maker pre-built. The exact LK67 that I have here comes in at about 120 US. I've got all the keyboards, switches and keycaps linked down below by the way if you want to check prices or buy something. Now as far as I know, Apple Maker aren't actually manufacturing this keyboard case and neither are Gamma K. I'm not 100% sure where it comes from, but you can find this under various different names like TM680 or Homo KF068. Though as Apple Maker offering this at $100, with really nice PBT keycaps and a great selection of switches, this is the best deal in my opinion. But weirdly enough, Apple Maker are also offering one of the strongest competitors of the TH68, the Apple Maker TH66. If you've seen my video about the best 75% keyboards, you probably know how much I like the TH80 by Apple Maker. And the TH66 essentially is the 65% version of this keyboard with basically the same great stock tuning, the same PBT die sub keycaps and south facing LEDs. So unsurprisingly, this is an amazing keyboard as well. But have a listen for yourself. Keep in mind that this keyboard goes for about 90 bucks, including Gateron Pro switches and PBT die sub keycaps. And these keycaps are pretty thick actually. If anything, I wish these would have a bit more texture because they're relatively smooth for PBT keycaps. Now, I have a hard time deciding whether the TH66 or TH68 is the best keyboard in the sub $100 segment. And to make things even a bit more difficult, I also stumbled upon the Skylong GK68 which is kind of an underdog, but I have to say that this keyboard easily is as good as the other two. The version that I have here has their nine-tailed Fox keycaps, which surely aren't everyone's cup of tea. But Skylong also offer the GK68 with more subtle keycap sets. If you like the GOA theme though, you're getting pretty thick dice up PBT keycaps. One minor drawback about the GK68 is that it doesn't support 2.4 GHz, which the other two keyboards do. Though what's pretty unique about the GK68 is what Skylong call light gasket. So there's a special sheet of silicone between the plate and PCB that can be compressed when typing. This effect honestly isn't really noticeable when typing as you really have to push hard to compress the silicone layer. But regardless, the resulting sound signature is pretty nice.
The GK68 that I have here is backed with Skylong's own Glacier Red switches, which really were a pleasant surprise to me. This is a linear switch with a 50 gram actuation force, and I'm pretty surprised by how smooth they actually feel. This is a really nice switch, and I think it's also a great option if you're looking for a smooth but affordable switch for other builds. With these switches and keycaps, the GK68 slots in right between the TH68 and TH66 on the clackiness to thockiness sound scale, with the TH68 being on the clackier side and the TH66 having more thock. So the choice between these three keyboards basically comes down to whether you prefer a thocky or a clacky sound signature and how you like the available color and keycap choices. I personally have a slight preference towards the TH66 as I like the sound signature and I also like the fact that it has south facing LEDs which is a feature that you typically don't find in this price range. But you honestly can't go wrong with either of these three keyboards. Now in the next price bracket from $100 to $150, we got three very different keyboards. But with the sub $100 segment being so strong, these might have a hard time justifying the slightly higher price. This keyboard here really costs only slightly more though, going for $109 for the wired hotspot version and $119 for the soldered dual mode PCB. It's the Vimilo Manilo, which definitely is an interesting name for a keyboard. The version that I have here is the dual mode version that can be connected via cable or Bluetooth. For some reason though, the dual mode PCB isn't available with hot swap sockets, which is a bit of a shame. Also, the Vimilo comes with ABS keycaps. These are ABS double shot and fairly high quality, but I think a good PBT set would have been the better choice. So yeah, this is a good looking keyboard and it has a pretty unique design and a good build quality. But honestly, if we compare this to the TH66, for instance, I think I'd be rather disappointed when spending an extra 20 to $30 just to get this over the TH66. So yeah, I'd only really consider the Manilo if you're totally digging this color scheme. Now next up is the glorious GMMK2, which comes in at about $120 for the pre-build. It has an aluminum top half, which makes it feel a bit more premium. Coming in at 900 grams, this is on the heavier side, considering that this still has an entry-level price tag. And it does feel solid and the machining is precise. The build quality of the case definitely is the strength of the GMMK2. The keycaps though are a bit underwhelming. Okay, they look pretty neat with the RGB shining through, but these are double shot ABS keycaps and they're pretty thin and the shape is slightly inconsistent. For 120 US, I'd really expect something better than 1.2 millimeter thick ABS keycaps. The included switches though are decent. This is Glory's own Fox linear switch, which does feel a bit smoother than a typical Gadron Red or other generic red switches. But compared to Apple Maker's Seasword switches or Skylong's Glacier Red switches, they stand no chance. You can really feel and actually hear the scratchiness compared to these very smooth switches. So with these switches and keycaps, it's really not surprising that the typing sound of the GMMK2 isn't the greatest. But for about $80, you could also just get the GMMK2 as a bare bone and source switches and keycaps elsewhere. So I swapped out A, S and D for some Skylong Glacier Red switches and Echo Double Shot PBT keycaps, which improves the sound a lot. But a full build like this would cost roughly 50 bucks more than just getting the GMMK2 as a pre-build. So double shot PBT keycaps would clearly kick the GMMK2 out of the sub $150 price bracket. This keyboard though comes with these exact double shot PBT 1.5 millimeter thick keycaps as a pre-build for more or less the same price as the GMMK2 pre-build. It's the ACR Pro 68 by Echo and it actually brings 
quite a few features to the table that you typically don't find in this price class. Double shot PVT keycaps, for instance, are surely not something I've seen on a $116 pre-built before. Gasket mounts also aren't common at all in this price range. The ACR Pro, though, comes with silicone gaskets. And Echo even throw a polycarbonate plate into the box that you can swap out for the pre-installed aluminum plate, if you like. They also include an additional spare sheet of pre-cut case foam and a ton of other stuff in the box, including the remaining keycaps, just in case you want to use them for a full-size keyboard in the future. So if you like, you can start customizing the ACR Pro right away, but I already like how it sounds with the aluminum plate straight out of the box. Even with the stock aluminum plate, there's some flex already, and the typing feel is much smoother and softer than every other keyboard we've looked at so far in this video. The silicone gaskets, of course, don't allow a lot of movement, but a part of the flex also comes down to the very soft rubber feet, which also compress slightly. Now, there honestly isn't much to criticize about the ACR Pro 68, but I have to say that I don't really like that it's so white. For a 65% layout, this takes up quite a bit of space on the desk. The machining could also be a bit more precise. I mean, the frosted acrylic looks great, but if you look closely, you can see that the tool left some grooves on some areas. But at this point, I'm really nitpicking. When it comes to the sound and typing feel, the other keyboards of this price class are really no competition. Now, in the next price bracket, we're starting to find keyboards that come with a full aluminum case. This is the Keychron Q2, and with over 1600 grams, this is in a totally different weight class than the more affordable keyboards. And yeah, it totally does feel like a much more premium keyboard. The Q2 also comes with other features that you would typically associate with more premium keyboards. It has a Poron gasket mount and is VIA compatible. Now, I have Keychron's pre-built version of the Q2 and this comes in at $189, fully assembled with keycaps and switches. The value proposition of the pre-built version is kinda insane honestly, if you consider that the barebone version of the Q2 goes for $169. So you're effectively paying 20 bucks for a set of Gedron G Pro switches and a set of double shot PVT keycaps. Unsurprisingly, these aren't the very best keycaps you'll ever find. They are a bit thin and the surface texture is very smooth. But this still is a pretty decent keycap set and I personally like the color combination and the overall look in combination with the gray case. Straight out of the box, the Q2 also sounds pretty good. There is a bit of case ping but other than that, I'm pretty happy with how it sounds. The Q2 also is the first keyboard we're looking at in this video that actually comes with screw-in stabilizers as standard. And Keychron did a good job tuning these stabilizers. Now, there actually isn't too much competition when it comes to full aluminum keyboards under $200 that come pre-built with switches and keycaps, which isn't very surprising, honestly. This one, though, can also be had below the $200 mark as a pre-built. It's the Tofa 65 by KBD Fans. This configuration with Gateron Pro Red switches and Dysa PPT keycaps is fairly comparable to the Keychron Q2 pre-built and would come in at $192. The exact spec that I have here is a bit more expensive, though, as I configured it with double shirt PPT keycaps, black ink V2 switches, and so on. And that's something I really like about the Tofo 65. KBD fans offer this with a ton of switches, different plates, keycap sets, and a selection of case colors and materials. I mean, take a look at this drop-down menu of different switches that you can choose. And there's even the option to have them hand-looped or spring-swapped, which is kinda nuts for a pre-built keyboard. So I went a bit all out and chose hand-looped black ink V2s, a brass plate, and double-shot PBT keycaps. So with the roughly $40 looping service included, this comes in at about 350 US, which makes the comparison a bit unfair, but the Q2 can honestly keep up pretty well.
Just like Keychron, KB Defense also did a pretty good job tuning the screw and stabilizers. And I also really like the a bit more muted and deeper sound profile. Now I also happen to have the exact keycap set that comes with one of the entry level versions of the TOEFL 65. And with some unlooped Gateron yellow pro switches, the comparison now is a lot fairer. Apart from the differences in their sound signature, the main difference between the Q2 and the TOEFL 65 is their different mounting styles. KB Defense decided to go for a classic tray mount as opposed to the gasket mount of the Q2. In consequence, the TOEFL 65 has a firmer typing experience with next to no flex, while the Q2 feels a lot softer to type on. There's really no better or worse here. It's entirely up to you if you prefer a softer or a firmer typing feel. And that's one of the biggest deciding factors between these two keyboards, because apart from that, they're pretty evenly matched in terms of their overall quality and value for money. But if you want basically a fully customized keyboard with enthusiast-grade switches out of the box without lifting a finger, then the TOEFL 65 is the keyboard for you. If you prefer a softer typing feel, then you have to go for the Q2 pre-built instead. Now, picking up the barebone version of these keyboards and building yourself, of course, is another option, and we'll be looking at more aluminum case keyboard kits in just a bit. But first, I want to talk about these two keyboards, which are a bit atypical. As the spacebar already tells us, they're made from plastic, which is kind of an unusual material in the premium keyboard segment that's dominated by aluminum cases. Yet, both of these keyboards come in at roughly 200 US, give or take a few dollars. And yeah, these have a pretty unique look with their see-through cases. Especially the Melgeek Mojo 68 in the so-called plastic edition is one of the most interesting looking keyboards that I've come across. And the Mojo also sounds pretty nice out of the box. But the question really is if you should actually consider spending that much on a plastic keyboard. And I might be a bit biased here as I really have a soft spot for heavy aluminum keyboards. But in a market where something like the Keychron Q2 or TOEFL 65 can be had for similar money or even slightly cheaper actually, I can't really see why anyone would choose either of these. Unless of course you're really digging the see-through look because you're obviously not gonna get that with an aluminum case. But other than that, I think you're getting more value for money with the Q2 or TOEFL 65. Here's a little sound test against the Keychron Q2. Now we're slowly starting to look at the more expensive stuff. This is the Mod 008 by Echo, and it comes in at $150 for the barebone, so you're looking at a minimum of $200 with basic switches and keycaps. Likely a good bit more, as this keyboard is kind of geared towards the enthusiasts who like to mod and customize the keyboards. So it's great to see that Echo are shipping this with a polycarbonate plate that can be swapped out for the pre-installed aluminum plate. They also include silicone and poron gaskets, a sheet of case foam and plate foam, as well as a poron switch pad. Less of which is pre-cut, but they kind of forgot about the encoder knob, which isn't a huge deal. The only thing that I'm not too happy with is that the kit only comes with plate mounted steps. At least they're looped and honestly don't sound too bad. But in this segment, I kind of like to see PCB mounted screw in steps. As I could also offer a set of screw in steps for 15 bucks, this is what we're going to be using for this build. I also decided to use the polycarbonate plate and build with all the foam, including the poron switch pad. So here's what the end result sounds like. I probably could have done a better job with the stabilizers by doing a holy mod, for instance. But I wanted to keep it fair and simple, so I only use what's provided in the box. And some loop, of course. Now, the sound of the Mod 008 kind of reminds me of the Keychron Q2, but with less case ping, which definitely is a good thing.
In my opinion, the Mod 008 sounds a bit better than the Q2, but the choice between these two keyboards is a pretty tough one, honestly, as both have some compelling arguments going for them. If you're looking for a keyboard that comes with a bunch of customization options out of the box, then the Echo Mod 008 is the winner. Also, the machining is slightly higher quality as the tolerances are a bit tighter, and the chamfering on the edges looks nicer. Though the encoder knob feels a lot better on the Q2. Not sure what Echo did here, but it's pretty wobbly. Another argument for the Q2 is that it has south-facing LEDs, which makes it compatible with all keycap sets. And it doesn't need proprietary software as it works with VIA. So as I said, it's really not an easy choice. And here is yet another keyboard that is VIA compatible and has south-facing LEDs. It's the ID67 V3 Best Type by Adobao. And the first thing you notice when picking this up is how insanely heavy this thing is. With a weight of roughly 2 kilograms for the full build, it's almost 500 grams heavier than the Echo Mod 008 or Tofo 65. The brass elements surely play a part in that, but the case in general is pretty solid. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of the coated aluminum, so I'm a bit disappointed that the white coating is the only color choice. I would have loved to see some more color choices and maybe even anodized finishes, just like Echo, Keychron and KBD fans offer. But I have to admit that the white looks pretty nice in combination with the brass accents. Also, it fits well with these Eidebau Dysub PBT keycaps if you ask me. So here's how the combination sounds with Epomeca Comte switches. There's really no denying that the stock stabilizers sound awful despite that they're actually PCB screw-ins and factory looped. So you probably want to swap these out immediately. Other than that, I quite like the sound profile. Here's how it compares to the Mod 008 and Q2. It's different, but I kind of like how it sounds. Though at the same time, I kind of expected a bit more from this keyboard. I mean, the barebone comes in at about 260 US, which is roughly 100 bucks more expensive than the competition by Echo, KBD fans and Keychron. And taking a look inside the keyboard, I fail to see anything that would justify spending that much more. In fact, the ID67 is only using a pretty basic gasket mount with thin silicone gaskets that don't allow much travel at all. And this is just a single PCB design. There isn't even an additional plate or other modding supplies included, which might justify a slightly higher price. So as far as I'm concerned, the ID67 V3 Best Type is a nice keyboard, but it should not be more expensive than the Q2, Mod 008 or Tofu 65. This keyboard, however, is priced very competitively. It's the Zoom 65 by Metatrix, and while this might sound a bit absurd to some people, with a price tag of $159 for the kit without switches and keycaps, this kind of shook up the keyboard market with its low price tag. Don't get me wrong though, a typical Zoom 65 build will at least break the $200 barrier, so I really don't want to call it budget or even cheap. But you're really getting your money's worth with this one. For starters, here's a little sound test. So if you like a thocky sound signature, you'll probably love this keyboard. And this is just an ordinary build using the stuff that comes in the box of the Bearbone kit, plus a set of Dyson PBT keycaps and some nice switches. So no fancy mods or anything like that. And I have to say that it's kind of amazing what Melitrix are able to provide for $159. Both in terms of the quality of the components, as well as the quantity of accessories. I mean, opening up the box is almost a bit overwhelming as there are quite a few individual components. This surely isn't the easiest keyboard kit to build, and might take keyboard beginners quite a few hours. So that's probably one of the biggest cons about the Zoom 65. If you don't enjoy things like carefully placing the provided Teflon strips in the stabilizer stems, the Zoom 65 is probably not the right keyboard for you. It certainly requires at least some level of keyboard enthusiasm to enjoy the whole process. But once you're done building, you're rewarded with this soft and flexible and quite unique typing feel. The Zoom 65 certainly has the softest typing feel of all the keyboards that I've tested so far. And if you take a look at the PCB and polycarbonate plate that both are covered in flex cuts, that's really no surprise. And Melitrix are also using Poron as a gasket material. 
Now, as addictive as it is to type on this keyboard, I have to say that the quality of the case itself is not on the same level as the Echo Mod 008. The powder coating on the Zoom 65 just looks and feels rougher than the smooth anodized finish of the Mod 008. And that's one of the biggest arguments to pick up the Mod 008 over the Zoom 65. Other than that, the Zoom 65 is really giving the Mod 008 a hard time. It also targets people who appreciate a bunch of customization and modding options, but it takes it just a step further. And in contrast to the Echo, it's VR compatible and it comes with south-facing sockets. There aren't any LEDs though, so no RGB puke on this keyboard. Nomelitrix also offer a full kit that comes in at only $179, including switches and keycaps, which is pretty nuts. Unfortunately, it's sold out now and I'm not sure if there will be more stock soon, but it's definitely worth watching out for. Generally, the stock situation with the Zoom 65 seems to be a bit more difficult as there are regular pre-orders and stock drops rather than the Zoom 65 being a regular in-stock item that you can pick up anytime you want. But this definitely is a special keyboard and it might be worth the wait. Now, if you still can't decide which one of all of these keyboards is the right one for you, then the sound test might help you make a decision. So the rest of this video will just be the typing sound of all the keyboards from this video. And if you decide to pick one up, I've got all the keyboards, switches and keycaps linked down below. Enjoy the typing sound.